Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Welcome to our webinar today. Uh, Ricardo and I are going to talk about... Uh... Ricardo, can you see my slides? Yes, I can. Hey, okay, Arthur. So we're going to be talking about, uh, you know, compliance uh, for medical devices and specifically uh, IEC 62304. Uh, Ricardo, I brought the hat today, right, so that we match the picture here in our, our, our actual slide. Ricardo is, is our uh, product marketing manager for re really for the compliance related systems, right? So R Ricardo's the core guy that, you know, I, I like to say he reads the standards so that you don't have to. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> you still have to, okay? I didn't just give you advice, <laughs> but Ricardo's the guy that'll help you, like, know how to you know, if you haven't been familiar, you've been struggling with it, this is some great advice. I've got some fun little stories about things that go horribly, horribly wrong because that's what I like to do. So uh, the basic agenda today, we're going to talk about this wild west of connected medical devices. And then we're going to talk about IEC 62304, of course, in specific, and, and some of what Parasoft can do to help you get there. And as I mentioned, we'll have that live Q&A at the end. So like I said, feel free. If you got weird questions, slap them in there. I like to start with a little, you know, some fun facts. Uh, the medical device space, particularly in security and reliability, is, is a tricky thing. We, we know that Software is the leading issue for medical device recalls. About 23% of recalls are caused by software. And that class one recalls are increasing. And partly this is just new innovation and new capabilities, right? They're, these devices do more and they have more connectivity. Therefore, you can get into them easier. And when you get in, you can do more easier, right? They've moved from being the connectivity used to just be telemetry and now it's control and it's frequently control of other systems as well which we'll see i have this little chart on the right which i i find is kind of fascinating right clearly infusion pumps outnumber imaging systems in the world but at the moment in terms of actual security issues imaging systems have been the leader i don't think this is a an issue to be complacent about infusion pumps. I think it's just this is what's coming. People have noticed too that you know like there's a lot of potential access points and attack services in the medical device space and, and hospital healthcare is being targeted because the medical devices are leading to the main systems and providing data and there's just so much data that's useful to someone who looks to monetize data, right? Whether it's identity theft or just selling the IDs directly or, or deploying this stuff in late attacks. So security is an issue. It's in the news all the time. I'm not even going to read down that list at the right. Feel free to look at it at your, at your leisure, right? But uh, think about this, right? There's so many breaches every year that for any given year, we can do a top, top five list or even a top 10 or a top 20. Um, as I was putting this presentation together, I think this news is from Tuesday this week. McAfee published a, a new vulnerability. This isn't a hack. It could be a hack, but it's a it's a researcher finding out that on a particular supply chain and a particular implementation, they were able to cross the boundary between the controlling device and the actual pumps themselves. And this is supposed to be a, you know, quote unquote, impenetrable boundary. And this is what we really worry about in attacks. It's not just the, hey, someone got in the pump and they reset it or they turned it off or they doubled the dose, which is bad enough. But it's, can I then reach into other pieces of the system and start bopping around inside of the healthcare provider network? And that is really the problem that we have in healthcare, right? Because once you start connecting things and you start connecting supply chains and you take into account, uh, you know, customers, hospitals, individual healthcare providers, clinics, uh, imaging devices, uh, online self-service things, diagnostics, pumps in the hospital, like it, it, the system is too big to put inside of a single firewall. But even if you could, there's actually still an issue, and that is that when you think about a healthcare facility, like fundamentally, people are on the inside of the firewall. If I if I think about my local hospital as a castle, like when I'm a patient, I'm inside of it, 
And, and the funny thing is, like, if we zoom in on this same picture, is that there's a pump sitting there, right? And depending on the location and the pump, et cetera, et cetera, they have ports, and sometimes they're protected and sometimes they're not. And sometimes they're access controlled and sometimes they're not. The point is that the potential is certainly there if you're not protecting all those things, right? Because essentially, from a hospital perspective, like every customer is a Trojan horse, right? Because they're on the inside. So it's it's a truly scary thing. And I only mention this because in a breach that we're going to talk about here in, in the anatomy of an attack, this was one of the issues, right? Uh, hopefully most of you are familiar with the WannaCry ransomware. It's built on top of some, you know, really nasty, nasty worm stuff. But, uh, and it's been floating around, like it, it hasn't gone away. It's a, it's, it's like a virus. It's never ending. And it had some pretty strong effect even three, four years ago, where over 200,000 systems around the world were affected. And, and uh, the UK in particular took a pretty nasty hit from it, right? And, and I like to point out that we got out of the original attack with the original WannaCry ransomware because of, I don't know, was it an accident? Was it a laugh? Was it a lark? But there was a kill switch, and there was an obvious kill switch, and our research found it relatively quickly. Like, as bad as this was, it could have been so much work. But, you know, in the UK and England, the National Health Service, they issued guidance around what to do with this. And if you go and read the guidance, and I, ha I have a link if someone wants to ask in the questions, I can provide it. But they say that you, you do a firewall to protect against this. but this device is inside the firewall, right? And the attack comes from inside. So firewall's an irrelevant thing. Not that you don't need a firewall. You need a firewall. But a firewall protects your perimeter. It doesn't protect the devices inside the perimeter. So, you know, it's, it's particularly nasty. In this case, again, this wasn't a case of, hey, let me, like, you know, change radiation levels or turn off the machine or break the machine or or steal images for a particular time it was merely a jumping off point right the fact that the machines weren't secure and the fact that boundaries as we talked about a moment ago that are supposed to be impenetrable actually aren't and they were able to get into you know main healthcare systems and and depending on the variations now of the of these various worms either exfiltrate data for privacy issues or you know uh, shut down systems and and uh, encrypt data for other ransomware type activities so it's a it's a, a you know a very very real issue it, we when we think about connected devices we always have to think about an impact beyond the device. And just one other final slide I want to do on WannaCry. And, and you know, again, feel free to peruse this at your leisure later. But, you know, in, in the flow of what an attack happens, right, somebody, like, checks a system out and figures out they weaponize existing problems. In the case of a lot of these, it's an old Windows uh, file share SMB problem that's a known CVE. It's one of those things that... If you keep your patches up to date, you're less likely to run into. And then they, you know, attach some kind of a payload designed to exploit a system like this. And then if you want to get really interesting, right, you, you not only exploit it, but then it's like, can I chain together a sequence of events? And as you see in the, in the next, in the center section, right, like lateral movement is the really interesting part, right? Let me move outside of this device and now start exploiting other weaknesses and chain them together until I get where I care about. And whether that's a, you know, a mainframe or shutting down all imaging systems or exfiltrating data, whatever it is, it's kind of, you know, I, I think of this in more of a generic term because these attacks are still ongoing at a well, I say a fairly regular basis. I might mean a highly regular basis. So uh, let's move on for a moment. Let's let's talk about ingredients now, right? When we talk about medical devices, they're obviously built up of components. And sometimes the components are there can be really shocking to us, right? Like we think about, you know, a slab of ground beef and an ingredient list that is massive, right? 
and we have the same thing when we deploy a device. And these days, the, the hardware list, is it, it can be pretty long in and of itself. We generally know what the list is because we need to so that we can deal with things like recalls. On the software side, the list might be as nasty as this, right? And it might be full of all kinds of crazy things. So it's really important when we think about things like, you know, what's in this and where did it come from? It, it's an issue of software transparency. It's also called bill of materials or software bill of materials. There's a, there's a piece of this called supply chain assurance or SCA, which is really making sure that we've dealt with known vulnerabilities in, in code level software and custom code as well as in packages deployed. It, it's all really important stuff. And I, I do want to point out one particular area here, right? Because when I look back at that ingredient list, there's a bunch of stuff that I just don't even know what it is and, and don't necessarily know where it came from. And I think the where it came from is one of those important things. And, and we see in some guidance around like the FDA, for example, that there's a category called software of unknown provenance or soup. And this makes me really uncomfortable. Unknown provenance is, is super, super scary, right? And, and again, when I think about a bill of materials and I step back to the, the holistic view of the device, it's really not software, but it's a part, and it's a part of unknown provenance. So, you know, feel free to play with that acronym on your own. But the truth is that having a good understanding of A, what are all the parts, and B, where they came from is very helpful because when it comes to some kind of an issue and a failure, if, if you don't know how many devices have a particular version of a particular software component and there's a problem found, you have to recall all of them. So, so knowing doesn't just help like the FDA and the auditors to, to force recalls on you or even your own safety people to, to do you know, self-modified safety campaigns, but they actually help you limit the scope of a campaign and hopefully they limit the existence of the campaigns. Knowing also helps you make sure that you've applied appropriate security patches, that you're aware of, you know, CVEs are, are really, you know, they're explicitly spelled out exploits with very known consequences so that you can be sure that they're either not relevant for you or they can't happen in your device. They also help in terms of unsafe components. There have been issues of, uh, what we like to call bad actors, right? Uh, threat actors, where individuals from certain countries have gone to open source projects and purposely injected code that either weakened, for example, encryption or literally, you know, inject a malware payload. And frequently we even see malware payloads and like ransomware payloads in known components. And so that's why that provenance matters so much, right? It might be that your bill of materials says that you know that you have, you know, a particular version of a particular library, but did you actually get it from the supplier and did you check the signature to be sure that it's the right version? Because that is certainly a threat that you have to take into account. And we do see that, you know, software supply chain attacks are affecting people so it's it's definitely an important thing to keep in mind. I also wanted to talk about, you know, like now that I've probably scared you a little bit, at least that was my my hope. <laughs> uh, what can you do, right? Like, let's give some useful advice. So one of the projects that I think is interesting is UL2900, right, from Underwriters Laboratory. It's cybersecurity for uh, network devices, right? Connected devices. And the truth is I expect that if you're doing a medical device, you're probably already working with your underwriter laboratory. You're already familiar with them. You have accounts, you know how to send devices to them. So uh, UL2900 now lets you move your certification beyond the hardware issues to the software issues. So it, it might be a great choice for you. It's also important to be aware that while the FDA hasn't yet spelled out very specific guidelines for things like static analysis, we do see that it's coming. But at the moment, they've, they've pretty much given their blessing to UL2900 so that if you go there and say, hey, we're doing static analysis and we're doing, you know, the, the coverage and the unit test and the peer review as outlined in UL2900, dash one or two or three, depending on our, our, our vertical space, then 
you don't have to explain why you chose that standard, right? They accept it as being appropriate. So it, it might be a light lift for you. Another one that I see all the time and that, that I'm kind of a fan of is the CERT Secure Coding Guidelines. They, they're called Secure Coding Guidelines, but they're actually equally useful for safety and reliability. And the cool thing about them is that they're really an engineering standard, right? So rather than focused on finding symptoms or pointing out like uh, specific exploits or weaknesses, they're focused on how you're constructing your software and avoiding constructs that are problematic in the field. You know, if you look at the language C, C++, even, even C Sharp and, and, and such, there's a lot of things that you can do that, you know, when you're deploying a device that has limited memory, limited resources, and nasty ramifications, there's things that you might do in a game that you wouldn't want to do in a medical device. So it's a great standard from that perspective. And, and I certainly see it in, in use a lot. And again, it's certainly easy as a thing to use for, uh, you know, the FDA, they're going to accept it. CWE and the CWE top 25 is definitely something you're going to hear about. Maybe people in your own supply chain are using or you're, you're forcing on people. It is security standard. It's not a safety standard. Uh, so you probably need to add it to something. It is a symptom-oriented standard, right? Its purpose isn't to help you build better software. Its purpose is to help you understand the coding constructs associated with the actual exploits happening in the field. So it's very helpful from a research perspective, but from a let me harden my application, it simply doesn't do hardening. It's more detection. It's it's a testing technology, right? Not a hardening technology. But if you are using it, do remember that there's a top 40. Okay, they don't call it the top 40. It's called on the cusp. And actually, UL 2900 calls out CWE top 25 plus on the cusp. So there's 40 items. And the truth is that if you really, really care, there's about 800 CWE items today. So if you're going to use CWE, start with the top 25. That's a great first step. Move to the top 40. And then when you hit that, don't just jump to 800, but start looking at the other categories, do some threat modeling, figure out what matters to you, and start putting in place CWEs for that. Um, OWASP, another classic one, just because lots and lots of people know it, and it's a, you know it's an open project. It's the Open Web Application Security Project. And the reason that I point that out is that it's open, so it's free, and there's lots of really, really cool training, but it's for web applications. And yes, you might have devices that have some cloud enablement, and some of the, the OWASP Top 10 might apply to you, but it's certainly not comprehensive in the world of a device. So just remember that if you're using it, you should be supplementing it with something to cover some of the specific issues you'll have. And just remember also that the point of the OWASP Top 10 is for training, right? OWASP has all these really cool things like WebGoat that help you run exploits and and learn what problems are, what they look like, and how to mitigate them in the code itself. So it's great for your developers to be familiar with OWASP. Again, this if if CWE is a first step, this is a baby step, right? So just remember that it might be useful to do along with something else, but by itself, it's probably not sufficient to get you across the line for certification. The other thing I like to remember now that I've told you all kinds of stuff that I expect you to do is that it turns out that quality, reliability, safety, and security have monstrous overlap. My bubbles here are actually, now that I stare at it, like I feel like the overlap should be much, much, much higher. We've seen in different research, like from the, the, the Software Engineering Institute, SCI, right, that runs CERT, is that you can predict security problems based on defects and that, you know, many, in fact, possibly even most critical defects that are being exploited are fundamentally coding mistakes. So, you know, in the C and C++ world, the, the big four, you know, numeric overflow, right, integer overflow, we've seen that in all kinds of systems. Buffer overflows and underflows and, you know, just basically buffer abuse is probably, if I put all the categories together, invalid or missing is initialization, right, screwed up initialization and, and, you know, using nulls or relying on nulls. In some cases, it's not checking for nulls and in other cases, it's expecting that null has a meaning that 
it doesn't really. So the point is that doing the right thing, like using a standard like CERT or, or putting in place a rigorous, maybe you're using Autosar, maybe you're using MISRA, right? But having a good, rich static analysis standard backed up by unit testing and coverage is going to solve all these. It won't make security and safety a separate step for you. It's going to build it into your process. So with that in mind, we want to go ahead and actually talk about the particular standard. So I'm going to pass this over to you, Ricardo. All right, that was fantastic, Arthur. I, gosh, I always uh, enjoy the analogies that you provide, uh, the, the ground meat there. That was uh, a nice visual. <laughs> Anyways, um, I'm going to start with a little history. Uh, standard IEC 62304 specifies the lifecycle requirements for the development of medical software and software within medical devices. The first edition of the standard was released back in May of 2006, and it's an adaptation of uh, IEC 61508. Therefore, by inheritance, it is a functional safety standard. It provides guidance for regulating the entire software lifecycle. So it covers development phases such as requirements management, architectural design, implementation, integration, test verification and validation, including maintenance. The standard um, has had one update in 2015, Amendment 1. Uh, a few requirements were added and others were amended, particularly those related to safety classification. Also, the handling of uh, legacy code and software item uh, preparation, which I'll touch actually a little bit later. The second edition of the standard, 62304-2021, um, has been in draft status for about five years. and actually was recently rejected uh, several months back. You might have heard 62304 2019 and 2020 and, and now 2021. Anyways, this draft version contains some great requirements uh, towards cybersecurity, but one of the problematic aspects is that the scope of the standard has been extended into health so uh, software or health software systems, which is not qualified as a medical device. Anyway, the latest version remains 2015, Amendment 1. The standard is comprised of nine clauses, which I will take you through each of them very quickly. Clause 6 is actually missing from this diagram that you see here, so I'm going to expose it now. So Clause 6 is all about maintenance, which is a crucial part of the software development lifecycle in medical devices. One other thing that is very important to understand about 62304 is that it expresses and expects that medical device manufacturers obtain and apply supporting information and practices from other standards. That's why you see that list below. So, for example, standard ISO 14971 on risk management is instrumental to 62304 in achieving compliance. Another example is IC 60601 which goes into more detail on the software development lifecycle regarding safety. You can see a much more detailed software development lifecycle in this V-model diagram. So let's start going through each of these uh, clauses. Clause 1 through 4 very briefly describe various high-level aspects of the standard. Clause 1 defines the software development lifecycle and expresses the importance of a maintenance phase. Then there is the importance of the other standards. Annex C provides this diagram that you see here, which shows the relationship with other standards. And you can see how other standards contribute and work together in the implementation of medical devices. In Clause 2, you will note that standard ISO 14971 is required, and I'll go into why in the next slide. Uh, Clause 3 contains terms and definitions. Clause 4 covers another required standard, ISO 13485, on having a quality management system in place. A quality management system helps the manufacturer document processes, uh, procedures, and sets group responsibilities. The QMS system helps the manufacturer be organized to mitigate risks, boost productivity, drive continuous improvement, and helps demonstrate compliance and much more. All right, let's go back to Clause 2 
and into risk management and then software safety classification. Class 2, also subclass 4.2 and class 7 in the standard are all about risk management. IC 62304 requires the use of a risk management process that is compliant with ISO 14971. 14971 deals specifically with defining a framework for effective management of the risks, which includes activities like identifying hazards, performing a risk analysis, and risk evaluation. On the far right, you will see a schematic representation of the risk management process defined in ISO 14971. This gets deep into the weeds, which we don't have time for, but this is a crucial task that leads to categorization of severity levels of potential hazard scenarios, um, levels such as catastrophic, critical, serious, minor, and negligible. Ultimately, the analysis derived from this uh, risk management activities will impact the software system under development, such as having a software safety class assigned to the software items. So according to the possible effects on the patient, operator, or other people resulting from a hazard, the software will be classified or assigned a class level based on severity. So class A means no injury, class B means uh, you know, non-serious injury, class C means death or serious injury. IEC 62304 2015 Amendment 1 provided some updates on software safety classification. There is a classification flowchart, as you can see on the right, and there was additional classification that was put on uh, where um, software items can be segregated and assigned different classifications. The circle diagram on the bottom kind of captures the, this stuff. Okay. So once you have done your risk analysis, the software classification level assigned to the software items ripple through the entire software development process. Now let's take a look at Clause 5. Clause 5 covers the entire software development lifecycle. The medical device manufacturer must perform software planning and deliver a software development plan. It must contain things like the software development process to be used, perhaps an agile approach, spiral, or perhaps waterfall. Deliverables like artifacts pertaining to requirements management, architectural design, software detail design, software verification, integration, and testing, and actually more. I'll very quickly give you a glimpse of each of the phases, but I'm also going to tie many of these requirements or subfaces to solutions that Parasoft provides. As you can see, I've included here at the bottom the Parasoft V model to give you a high-level view of the solutions that we offer for each of the phases in the software development process. Note that we also have integrations with other solutions like JAMA, CodeBeamer, Polarian, and others, which complement or help fulfill many of the 62304 requirements. As you can see on the left side of the V, and on the right side of the V, we have solutions in the verification and validation development phases. Also be aware that Parasoft Solutions have been TubeSuit certified for IEC 62304 in use on safety critical medical devices. So we have a certificate and you can see the emblem on the bottom left. Class 5.1, um, I created a table showing each requirement or subclass. And the far right columns show classification, A, B, and C. If there's an X in the field, then the requirement or subclass is recommended for that class. You will notice that class 5.1 has to do with much planning for each of the development phases and artifacts related to the planning, which is captured in documentation. And the tools that will be used, like ALM tools, configuration management tools, and of course, Parasoft for testing and others. Parasoft contributes to most of these subclasses by facilitating a reporting and analysis project dashboard with automated document generation, verification validation results, change-based management through configuration management, and more. Clause 5.2 activities require the manufacturer to gather all requirements, regulatory, 
your customer requirements, cybersecurity requirements, and any other requirement that applies to the device. These requirements need to be partitioned into their domains, hardware, software, and mechanical, but um, we are strictly addressing software, so software requirements need to be decomposed into system requirements. Risk analysis, we evaluated on all of these system requirements, and they need to be verified through traceability back to the original requirements. System and acceptance test cases are also needed to be defined or created, and they need to also be traced back up to requirements. Parasoft has uh, integrations with ALM tools like CodeBeamer, JAMA, Polarium, which they provide a robust solution and requirements analysis, design, and partial verification. I say this because Parasoft completes the verification through traceability to our test cases, test results, and also you can link down to the code. And Parasoft validates requirements through test execution. So we perform unit you know, testing, integration testing, system testing, regression testing, and other testing uh, methods as well. Clause 5.3 activities requires the manufacturer to define the software architecture of the device from system requirements. So you architect the software subsystems and their interfaces. Some of the software components may also be legacy or software of unknown provenance. Soup. And to reiterate what Arthur said earlier, uh, Soup is off-the-shelf software that may have been developed with an unknown software development process which did not address safety. Soup software um, may have been out in the field working for quite some time, so there could be a sense of comfort in its reuse. However, a risk analysis must be performed and assurances that SOUP will meet functional and performance requirements, as well as that it will operate properly on the hardware it's going to run on. With uh, Parasoft solutions, you can test on target hardware. We support lots of development ecosystems that includes ARM, Intel, microcontrollers from Microchip, TI, Renesas, uh, compilers like IAR, Microsoft, Kyle, and there's so much more. Parasoft also has a powerful integration with an architectural design tool called Latix. Latix helps you understand, define, and control your software architecture. Parasoft then helps enforce the architecture with automatic detection of rule violations to control undesirable architectural deviations. We have an on-demand webinar and demo on the integration with Latix, which you can find on our website resources page. So I recommend that you uh, visit our page. Clause 5.4 activities requires refining the architecture and its interfaces into software detail design. These detailed designs articulate the functional and non-functional capabilities that each unit must provide. This activity further refines requirements and they should be linked to higher level requirements and to detailed design artifacts. You will then have a finer level of traceability where you can find missing gaps between requirements, design, implementations, and the test cases that vary verify the requirements. Parasoft provides capabilities to perform walkthroughs or code reviews on implemented detailed designs. And the refined requirements that link to the detailed design artifacts can be verified and validated through test cases realized by Parasoft. Test cases that test interfaces and validate design functionality and verify requirements. Clause 5.5 activities require the manufacturer to write the code for each software unit as expressed by the detailed design and requirements. Also provide acceptance criteria or verification that the code does what it's supposed to do and that risk control measures have been implemented. Not captured in this table uh, are the additional acceptance criteria in subclause 5.5.4 which includes test verification methods like data and control flow, initialization of variables, memory management, including memory overflows, boundary value conditions, and more, which Parasoft supports. Parasoft really shines starting from this clause on through clause 5.7. Some of the automated test verification methods Parasoft provides are static analysis, which supports data and control flow analysis, memory overflows, and much more. We also support coding standards like MISRA, AutoSAR, CERT, CWE, which uh, Arthur mentioned. Uh, in fact, organizations can create their own custom coding standards using our tool. I recommend that you uh, follow the QR code and watch a demo video of our solution in action.
I've also put this QR code in the, um, our ending slide as a reminder. In the demo, if you watch the video, you will see test methods like static analysis, unit testing, and structural code coverage. We have other videos and collateral on testing methods like system testing and integration testing, which leads me to actually the next clause. Clause 5.6, activities require the manufacturer to perform software integration and integration testing. Here you've started to move up a level of abstraction from the unit to integrating software items. These integrations need to be tested and ensure that the transfer of data and control across these integrated items function as intended, including the interfaces between them. Regression testing is also part of this activity, and because bugs are found, the problem resolution process needs to be applied here. Class 9 addresses the problem resolution process, so we'll cover that as well later on. Anyway, Parasoft supports integration testing, regression testing, and we have integrations with tools like JIRA where identified and captured bugs through testing with Parasoft can be exported to JIRA for defect management or problem resolution. In uh, class 5.7, here you've moved up to another level of abstraction from integration testing to system level testing. You may know this as black box testing. These uh, activities ensure that the system functionality and performance is built according to requirements. Also that if software changes are made, this includes new requirements or functionality to, to be implemented or bug fixes, if they happen, then regression testing is required and test results and progress should be recorded. Parasoft supports system testing and to ensure that you've done enough testing, structural code coverage for statements, branch and modified condition decision coverage is also supported. Change-based testing is another valuable feature and performed during regression testing where instead of running all test cases, only the validating test cases are run automatically which tests only the code that has changed. And all the test results are tracked and documented which compliance reports can be uh, auto-generated. Clause 5.8 activities require that the manufacturer document test verification results, which includes compliance reports and all anomalies or issues captured to have been answered or resolved. Parasoft uh, auto-generates lots of reports. Uh, there are compliance reports and test results, progress towards completion, and actually uh, much more. You know, also Parasol, just to go back, Parasol DTP is our intelligent dashboard where it consolidates testing results, it generates compliance and detailed reports, and performs actionable analytics. Now, Clause 6, um, I've covered some of Clause 6, but it requires the manufacturers to establish their software maintenance plan. Many incidents in the field um, happen after the product has been released into the market. And so some of these incidents are related to maintenance, product maintenance. So processes and assurances need to be in place to prevent inappropriate software updates and upgrades. Clause 6 is considered as important as the development phases in Clause 5. So you see in the diagram, it's also actually integrated into Clause 5. For example, a problem or bug is identified out in the field. That fix of software or software change needs to go through each of the development phases. This again ensures a safe, secure, and reliable system for um, that software change. This is class 6 in table format, and Parasoft, of course, solutions uh, support each of these. We covered Clause 7, which is about risk management. Clause 8 is about having a configuration management process and establishing a means to identify configuration items. This means versioning of the software, how and when to baseline and addressing other characteristics that identifies configuration items like title or name, archived history, and more. Change management is also part of this. What, when, and who changed the item? Was it verified and was it approved? Class 9 is about having a problem resolution process in place. Are all defects or problems captured, investigated, analyzed for trends as well? Have they been remediated, verified, and ensure that documentation has been updated? Okay, that you know, was a very quickly glimpse through the 62304 standard. And so I highly recommend that you visit our website, parasoft.com, or follow us on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, or send us an email if you have any questions. Again, if you want to see the product in action, take a snapshot of the large QR code and watch a demo video to see how 
some of these testing methods um, are, are applied and they work. I've also added uh, information about our other testing solutions for Java, C Sharp, and VB.NET uh, with QR codes to informative collateral. That's where they'll, they'll take you. All right, so let's open it up for Q&A. All right, uh, Ricardo, I've, I've got some questions here that uh, I can feed to you that we've gotten from people. And again, you're, there's still a chance to throw in a few more if you've got some while we're talking. Um, do you provide services like training and mentoring on IEC 62304 and, and the, you know, submitting approval to the FDA? Um, yes, actually, we have a partner called Valentium. Uh, they're a fantastic company. They offer uh, Parasoft training and mentoring in all that is related to medical devices. In fact, they actually design, develop, and manufacture medical devices. And I think that there's a webinar on our site as well, right, that we did with them, so people could go watch that. Yeah. Um, how does 510K work with IEC 62304? Mm. Okay, yeah, there, there are uh, two paths to get your medical device out in the market, um, 510K or PMA. Now, 510K is a pre-market approval submission made to the FDA by the medical device manufacturer to demonstrate that the device they want to put out in the market is as safe, effective, and basically equivalent or identi almost identical to an already legally uh, marketed 510K device. It usually applies to class one and class two devices, and it helps shorten the time to market. Now, IEC 62304 is one of the standards that is referred to as for guidance to the manufacturer in the use of a software lifecycle process like we just went through. And, and so it provides the risk analysis and test verification required of uh, 510K. All right. Excellent. So um, another one is, uh, are there any best practices you recommend in software development for medical devices? Um, yeah, there, there are several recommendations. Um, my experience uh, has been, you know, you want to make sure you have thorough and complete test documentation. This is uh, a key to getting your product approved. Also, you want to have a complete end-to-end -end requirements traceability. You want to find any missing gaps between requirements and tests or design. And you also want to um, do complete code coverage. I recommend 100% code coverage of statements, branches, and MCDC. I know some folks out there don't. They'll just do 80%. But it really uh, helps you identify or make sure that you've tested and looked at all the code. So all of these really help you achieve approval. Uh, they address any audit issues and provide transparency and good communications, not just within your development team, but also with the FDA. Yeah, and I, I, I have to agree with that, uh, Ricardo. Like, I'm, I'm very uncomfortable with code that's never been tested, right? <laughs> I know sometimes it's hard, right? There's strategies that you might need to deploy to, to test certain kinds of code, but Wow, it's it's a little frightening, right? Like it's 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 in that same category for me as soup. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. All right, so uh, one more question here. This has been about compliance of embedded software, but what about other types of testing, like interoperability and GUI testing? But you know, our devices are connected. What do we do? No, actually, that's a very good question. Uh, since our presentation has been focused around embedded safety and security critical software, you know, we did not touch on uh, GUI and other types of testing. You know, Parasoft uh, offers solutions like Parasoft Selenic for UI testing, Parasoft uh, Swap Test for API testing, and Parasoft Virtualize for service virtualization. Uh, you know, these are other testing methods that really merit their own airtime. And as you just heard, we have dedicated solutions for these testing methods. You know, I recommend that you visit our website, and in the resources page, you will find lots and lots of collateral videos, uh, white papers on all of these other testing topics. So, and, and that's what makes Parasoft unique, is that not only do we uh, support the embedded safety critical, but we also support the enterprise um, software applications as well. Yeah, and you know, Ricardo, I've been talking to some of our clients who are actually doing what uh, 
what might be called continuous compliance, right, where the compliance activities aren't performed at the end of the cycle. They're part of the CICD, and therefore they have, like, full deep automation, including even hardware and loop and, and test environment management so that they can test all the variations of, of uh, you know, like chips and operating systems and, and things like that and different kinds of pumps that it would go into, for example, uh, and using virtualization so that you can, you know, decouple things that would slow down that kind of fully automated end-to-end -end compliance on demand. So it's, it's uh, you know, again, that continuous compliance can be a, a really cool goal, and we see people doing it successfully. Yeah, we are. We have several customers who are uh, developing their pipeline, uh, automating their pipeline, do, performing static analysis, unit testing, all automated, saving them huge amounts of time, and, and so making their teams productive and lots of cost savings there. So that's actually another uh, best practice that I would recommend that you apply if you're not applying um, a continuous integration and continuous delivery uh, workflow. Yeah, yeah, I've, I've, I've kind of come to the viewpoint that even though Agile caught on in a big way in the enterprise long ago, like Agile in embedded space is perhaps a bigger value because there's just so much to manage and because of the safety needs and the, uh, frankly, the regulatory requirements, it's just great to have a, you know, a full CI/CD, uh, you know, maybe even containerized pipeline that can perform all the necessary variations of testing, gather up the results, and and not only let me know that I'm good or not good, but can provide the the artifacts necessary to make an auditor happy. So. <laughs> yes. Yes. And actually, you mentioned containerized, which, uh, yeah, we I, I love using containers. Uh, we've noticed that our customers are uh, happily using our, uh, you know, our Docker containers that we offer where they can deploy the same kind of environment to all of their engineers. And so they're all testing uh, uh, equivalently within these, these um, uh, you know, uh, virtual environments. So it's, it's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that this whole you know, modern development, DevOps, containers, pipeline workflows is proving to be very, very effective in safety critical industries. So I think it's pretty exciting. Well, that was the last question that we had in there. We thank everyone for coming. Again, we will send out links with uh, the video so you can watch it later, share it with your friends, come to the site and check out. We've got some QR codes here. You can, you know, watch some demos. Uh, if you'd like to hear about a particular standard, Make sure you send an email or hit us up on Twitter, and uh, Ricardo and I will lay it out for you. So with that, thanks, everyone. Have a great morning, afternoon, evening, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye, everybody.